Welcome to the South Seas ABE room where you're going to be hearing a talk on a thousand ways to die in mobile OAuth presented by Yuan, Yutong and Eric. Before we begin uh, a couple quick notes in the business hall in Bayside AB that's the big vendor room all kinds of great things to come and see there terrific vendors. There will also be a welcome reception from 5.30 until 7 tonight. The Black Hat Arsenal is on in the Palm Foyer on level 3. That's just around the corner from here I believe. And also the Pony Awards are happening tonight in the Mandalay Bay BCD room. I think that's just the next one over uh, at 6.30 tonight. And also thanks to everybody for putting your phones on vibrate so we don't interrupt the talk. And that's it. So please go ahead. Hello. Okay. So hi everyone. This is uh, Yutong. Uh, we're gonna bring you today is like 1,000 way to die in mobile auth. So uh, sitting on my left side is Yuan, and uh, uh, on my right is Eric. Uh, Shuo, who is like sitting in the audience seat, is over also here today. Uh, Robert and Par uh, Patrick are now uh, with us uh, today. Uh, me and Yuan are gonna be the ma uh, major speaker uh, for this talk, and. Uh, Okay, so we're gonna to start uh, to share with you like how we broke a lot of uh, all our stuff. So we know this is a uh, backhand, so uh, we don't want to uh, like save all the goodies in the like very end, and we're gonna show you guys that all these demos like right now. Uh, okay. Cool. Uh, so the first one is actually how we like break uh, authentication in Instagram. <laughs> Uh, we have this, uh, we found this bug or vulnerability in Instagram like two, uh, two years ago and they already fixed it. So uh, like for the demo we use a different app like Wish is also a very popular app in uh, like uh, mobile app for like, shopping. Uh, it's like top in the Android app store. And uh, uh, this uh, attack is still not fixed in uh, Wish right now. So. Um, you can see uh, attacker can log into uh, Wish using attacker's account. And this is like attacker's account. So like uh, attacker created another app which is like malicious. It gains uh, a user, a legitimate user, like a uh, victim, Bob's uh, Facebook access token. When like with Bob logins, like uh, attacker's malicious account, like uh, attacker can get this uh, uh, access token from Bob. Yeah, what attacker can does here is attacker still log in into Wish with attacker's own Facebook account, like same credential. But uh, when attacker click on OK, it actually attacker intercepts a request uh, come, uh, come back from Facebook. Uh, attacker exchanges the access token which belongs to the attacker uh, to Bob's access token. Like that's happening in the background. And now attacker actually log into Bob's wish account. Uh, that's the first demo. Uh, second demo is uh, so we like if you use OAuth before, you all know there is a permission page, which is a consent page, and we found like uh, like Tencent, which is like very very famous uh, uh, provider in uh, China. Like in their mobile flow, they don't have this consent page. So here we show like this uh, user's account management page. It indicates like this user has not authorized any permission, like any app at all. So, but when user trying to log in uh, application with their Tencent account, like after enter their uh, uh, the credential, yeah, the user are actually directly log in. So there is no consent page, even though like their uh, uh, user never authorized this app ever before, and. Uh, this like open like you can like basically the app can ask 
any permission they want, like all the permission they can have from Tencent and like without notify the user. So the user won't know uh, without like the, the consent and like the app can get every permission. And uh, what is interesting is like actually like for their, uh, for Tencent, the mobile app, the so full mobile version, they do have a consent page. But for the, um, uh, for the mobile, they don't. We have learned how the attackers can log into the benign user's account. Now let's see how benign user can be tricked into logging to attacker's account. Here we present a demo which shows how, uh, which use auto code logging with GitHub. So first, the attacker get into auto code page and click login with GitHub. The attacker will input his username and password for GitHub so that he will get authorization token from GitHub. This token is similar as a session token. But instead of continuing to log in, the attacker save this code and actually embed the code into a malicious link. Then, when the benign user is tricked to click on the link, the benign user is sending a request including the code which point to attacker's account. Because auto code don't check who is this user, they will just use the authorization code to represent which user it is. So then, benign user is logging to attacker's account. This attack could have very severe consequence. It's very, it's a standard logging CSF attack. So if this app is associated with any payment options, for example, the benign user might just add their bank account into the app and lost money. The last demo we're gonna show is how we break into Facebook authentication. So here we have one attacker which follow all Facebook OAuth flow legitimately. So the attacker implement Facebook OAuth inside the web view. Then the attacker will be able to get no, the attacker will be able to get the cookie from Facebook. We will talk about more details about this. But remember that getting cookies from WebView is a feature supported by Android and iOS. And this feature has lots of legitimate usages. That's why it's not so easy to fix this problem. So we have said after user login with Facebook, the attacker, the malicious app which embed WebView will be able to get the long-term cookie from Facebook. You can see like these are the cookies that Facebook using. It's a long time cookie, so it will stay alive for a long time. After getting the cookie, the attacker can just set the cookie and apply the cookie to log into user's Facebook account. Now, all the information and the whole account is in the control of the attacker. These four demos are just the tip of iceberg. In fact, the problem with OAuth is a very pervasive problem. In 2014, we have started the OAuth usage. We found that 60% of 200 Android and iOS OAuth applications are implemented incorrectly. Facebook, Twitter, Evernote, Pinterest, Instagram, this is just a, a few victims that could suffer from these attacks. We have a really long list to go. Now, after two years, when we look back at these problems, we found that these problems are not fixed, and there are more new attacks with OAuths. And you might wonder how bad are these attacks? Like you have seen some, already seen some flavor in the demo that these attacks have very severe consequences. 
the attacker can impersonate a legitimate service like Pinterest. Attacker will also be able to access all user content inside services. Attackers can steal Facebook cookies. Attackers can do login CSRF. In the worst case, attacker can get full account compromised. They can access all the information and control the whole accounts. You might wonder, why can't developers use all security? Why do they make so many mistakes? There are several reasons. And most of the reasons are very pervasive. First, there's a widely confusion between authorization and authentication. Developers misunderstood the security implication, the difference between the two concepts. Second, developers don't know who to trust. They don't know whether to trust the client. They don't know how should they protect their security information. Third, all spec is really broad and confusing for normal average developers. For example, I wonder who had read 71 pages for OS just for suite model for OS 2.0. Also, since OS involves three parties, it's very important for the, all the multi parties to, co to collaborate together to build a secure authentication and authorization. Finally, all spec is majorly written for web applications, not for mobile apps. So in this talk, we choose eight vulnerabilities to discuss and share with you our understandings about how to do OAuth security. Yeah, okay, so we talk about a lot of stuff, like away, uh, now we like take a step back, so I want to talk about more detail. Like first question is like, uh, what is OAuth? So like, I think a lot of uh, uh, you already use OAuth before, and even you haven't like probably you should do it now because like when you're busy in catching all the cool Pokemon, like you log, when you sign up, you sign up with OAuth. That's like Google's uh, account. And when you use a lot of like uh, you almost like always see like logging with Facebook, so that's OAuth as well. So OAuth is actually a protocol for authorization. Um, there are three party uh, involved in this process. Uh, the first one is uh, end user, the user who we also say is like resources owner who actually owns the resources. And the second one is a uh, service provider who pro like who actually store or like uh, controls like users resources where user has. And the third one is a relying party who won't get the resources from the user. So when you say authorization is, uh, you can think about like, like uh, user is a, a resource owner and the service provider is a bank. And it, uh, it stores all the resources like user own. Like user is basically giving the permission which is like you can think about is a key to the resources, uh, to the realm party to access behavior of uh, user to get the uh, protected resources. Just think about like uh, Facebook is a bank of all the cat pictures. Like user all. And uh, this is a brief uh, history of OAuth. So OAuth 1 uh, draft came out from uh, 2007, and it take around three years to become standardized. And like OAuth 2 uh, came out like two years later in 2012. So when we say like OAuth 2, like people sometimes think like OAuth 2 is like a improved version of OS one, but basically, but like they are actually separate. But like uh, they come with like uh, separate people made the dra uh, a draft, and like these are like they are very different. So in OS two, they are uh, in the uh, RFC. It officially defines four kind of like grand type. Uh, it's like how I, how this flow can be uh, established. Uh, the first one is implicit flow grant. Uh, uh, the second one is uh, authorization code grant, and uh, there are resource owner password credential grant and uh, uh, client credential grant. So the first two are like uh, for us two, like are used uh, majority, and like we're gonna focus on these two uh, grant type or flow uh, in this talk. Uh, 
So okay, uh, let's start with uh, OS one. So uh, if you are an OS one developer and you are like uh, registering uh, your application in a OS one service provider, this is a uh, account like or application setting page you're gonna see. So the most important two uh, value here are uh, the first one is a uh, consumer key, which application key, and the second one is a uh, consumer secret, which also is called it. Uh, 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 API secret. So during this flow, there are like as we said before, our three participants: uh, user, service provider, and relevant party. At very beginning, relevant party gonna ask uh, to want to uh, send a request to service provider to say, "I want this is my application ID, and I want to access all these kind of resources uh, of this user." So this request, so the square uh, parenthesis means like the request actually is signed by uh, the application secret we talked about before. The service provider can verify this uh, the signature. And after that, service provider uh, sent a request token back to the relevant party. So what the, uh, the, then the relevant party actually can redirect the uh, uh, request token uh, 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 with uh, redirect callback URL, redirect URL to the user and redirect to the uh, service party to gain the permissions. From the users, gonna see this page from the service provider to this app. It actually basically ask user whether they want to authorize this uh, RAM party application to access certain permission. And once on once user click on authorize this app, the uh, request token will redirect back to the callback URL Relang party provided. And then Relang party can sign, sign the uh, signed version of the request uh, token to the service provider. Service provider can return back an uh, access token, which is like the Relang party actually can able to access the protected resources. And when Relang party uh, access the resources, you need to sign the access token as well. So how to know like uh, the relevant party is the one user going to permission to how to verify the identity of the relevant party? Uh, this is very simple in the OAuth one model because every uh, every time when relevant party sends a, a token uh, to the service provider, it has to be signed with this secret, and the secret is stored in relevant party's web server, so it's only known between uh, service provider and relevant party. And now we come to our first vulnerability. Uh, what if what if the secret is now stored in a, a securely in a, a web server? In a lot of mobile case, like relevant party is actually using a mobile application or mobile client, and to like the simplified flow and simplified work, they store the secret uh, in the mobile application directly. And then the uh, or the step seven uh, when they sign a uh, uh, access token, it cannot be trust since the secret is in the application. So what we did there is we have a Pinterest application and we decompile the application. It's now very hard to find the uh, OAuth secret since like you can just search secret and this is here, it's the actual code. And once you have the secret, you can be pr pretend to be Pinterest. So what's the impact? A uh, Malaysia app can impersonate a legit application and it just broke the OS1 authorization model. So we like uh, when we found this uh, issue, uh, there are like two uh, well-known applications impact. One is Coral, one is Pinterest. And they like after we notify this uh, two uh, company and they both revoke their uh, secret immediately. And Coral uh, replied to us and they just like at that time they uh, stop, uh, they make the uh, Twitter login non-functional, and right now when we check, uh, both applications no longer use Twitter login anymore. So uh, to do it right, just don't store any secret in the mobile application. Very simple. And like uh, after OS one, and like the author of OS really uh, one find some issue, and they have a approved version, which called OS one point oh a. And the, uh, what is at over there is uh, it's a verifier. So this verifier in the step four, 
uh, not only the request token, but also a verifier gonna redirect send back to the relevant party. Relevant party need to sign the verifier with the uh, request token uh, and send back to the service provider. Server provider not only to verify uh, the signature and also need to verify the verifier is the same uh, is sent to the relevant party. So the verifier only gonna be sent to the registry redirect URL. That's a, a security model here. But we can still uh, have our like uh, same similar validity in one point oh eight as well. So this is a vulnerability we found in uh, Evernote. So uh, what we did there is like we uh, first of all, similar to a last attack, attack, we get a, a local store uh, a secret from a, a relevant party using all, uh, Evernote, and. Uh, at step three, we change the callback URL into a callback URL we control. It's like evil uh, redirect URL. And what uh, uh, Evernote uh, did wrong at that time is Evernote uh, didn't check the redirect URL, like whether it's matching the one uh, relevant party registered, whether it's a legitimate uh, redirect URL. It just redirect the requ uh, request token and verifier back to what URL is provided. So like. Uh, then the attacker gets a verify, uh, verifier, attacker also has a secret. It can make legitimate uh, uh, signature out of the request token verifier and get a legit access token, access uh, uh, user's resources. So uh, how to do is right. Uh, we'll talk about what real party should do. Now store uh, client secret in the mobile application and for a uh, service provider, like register the callback or redirect URL and check whether they match the register one. Okay, we talk about this like OS 1.0, OS 1.0A, and uh, from developer's point of view, like what developer should we use for uh, OS or for authorization? Uh, like based on the flow graph, you already seen like the OS 1 is very, very complicated. There are a lot of redirection. They are, uh, they allow uh, developer to know uh, cryptography. So this is now trivial and uh, the answer to what, if you want to use OAuth for authorization, uh, the answer is like not use OAuth one. And as we said, like two, uh, there is a very, very uh, more simplified version came out after OAuth one, which is OAuth two. OAuth two solved some problems, but OAuth two still had many security vulnerabilities. As we have mentioned, we'll be focusing on the two common flow for OAuth. 2.0, which is implicit grant flow and authorization code flow. These two flows are very different. You can just think of it as two different versions of OAuth 2.0. So first, let's see how OAuth 2.0 implicit flow works. You can see from diagram that the implicit flow is much more simplified than the previous protocols. The only critical requirement here is that relying party must supply a redirect URI to get the access tokens. To summarize, there are majorly three differences from previous protocols. First, there's no relying party secret. That's nice. Developers don't have to worry about how can they protect the secret. Second, there's no signature or encryption so developers don't have to go through the burdens of dealing with this crypto stuff. Third, implicit flow introduced a concept about barrier token, which is that the access token is not bound to a relying party. That is to say, anyone who gets the access token will be able to access user's information on the service provider. You can see that the access token is really important for authorization here. Then here comes the question, how can we handle the directions? How can we give the access token to the right relying party? In the web, web world, people are using browser redirections so that they can make sure the receiver of the access token should be the same as the one that registered redirect URI. But how to do the redirection in the mobile space? 
For example, Android has a scheme called Intent UI scheme. So the running party application register this intent. In iOS, they also have a similar scheme called Customize scheme. Is this secure? The answer is no. So this is the third vulnerability because attackers can overwrite the redirect URI in the mobile. For example, in Android, the attacker can just register and overwrite the callback for the intent scheme. So they will be able to get access token. Since the access token is not bound to a special relying party, the attacker will be able to access all the information inside user's account. LS have the similar problem. The impact is serious. Attacker will have access to all Facebook data with all, without consent. How to do it right? For example, in Android, they are using the signature to do secure redirection. So each application will be signed by the developer key. You can see the code snip is for Android verifying the, hash, the key hash of the package. Uh, up until several months ago, iOS stopped, start doing similar verifications. It's just start this year. Okay, uh, let's talk about authentication and authorization. So when we talk about auth, like these two concepts always come together, and uh, it's now like sometimes like they get like uh, 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 sometimes they mess up together, like which is what. We already talk about authorization. Let's uh, talk about authentication. Actually, authentication is like little bit uh, simpler compared to authorization. It's basically uh, who who the user is, who you are. So in this case, is uh, the service provider already know who the resource owner, who the user is, and the user want to using uh, uh, his or her existing session and reuse there in the, uh, another relevant party. So uh, this is the same uh, identity, and like, and and the user want to use this identity to, to use the relevant party service or like to store the, uh, user's data in the relevant party. So you can see the major difference. The major difference over here is uh, where the uh, resources or which service a uh, user is using. So in authorization, a uh, user allow relevant party to access data or resources within, with user stored in the service provider. But in authentication case, is using want to use a consistent identity and use like use that to, within the relevant party services to store like data is belong to the relevant party. So if you like when you use your uh, OAuth to impossible and if you miss the authentication for with authorization, there is a vulnerability. You already talk about X token actually is like now bounded is like a barrier token. So any party with a X token can access users uh, data with giving permissions. So in the step three, when real party trying to use a uh, uh, X token to get uh, user information from service provider and use that for authentication. Uh, so, uh, step four will return back a, a user ID from the service provider. And, and the and relevant party can use that user ID as an identifier in their service. So what can go wrong there? So this is a attack uh, breakdown, which we, uh, we had a demo with for the uh, which one. So first, uh, attacker have a malicious application. Uh, Bob is using this malicious application. First, it authenticates with Facebook. And Facebook, uh, think this is legit and return Bob's access token to uh, attacker. Now, attacker have a uh, Bob's access token. So what attacker gonna do next is attacker gonna to log in with attacker's account uh, uh, in Facebook from which. And uh, uh, Facebook gonna return uh, attacker's access token Attacker intercept that request, replace attacker's access token into Bob's access token, and which gonna ask Facebook using Bob's access token to who this user is. Facebook return user, uh, Facebook's, uh, Bob's Facebook user ID, and which think, okay, this is Bob, and 
which logging into attacker into Bob's account. So this is uh, uh, something uh, in behind the scene. So the first, uh, the one on the left is a response from Facebook. You can see like this is like uh, what uh, scope uh, this requires getting, and also in the very at the very bottom you can see the act token, access token. And what Wish actually does is like it gets a uh, same access, it gets the access token immediately and using it to call Facebook me endpoint to get user information and use this uh, uh, response in the response you can see the ID using this ID to identify who the user is in their system. And in the attack case we just described, uh, which can log in into the victim's account. So what is the impact? Uh, the impact is like attacker can get a full account compromise with the reliant party app. In the attack uh, we demoed is Wish, but in 2014 we found this vulnerability in a Facebook in-home application, a third party application uh, Instagram. So uh, at that time uh, there is a vulnerability to get full account com compromise in Instagram. So you may wonder like if I want to do like OAuth or like uh, third party authentication, uh, how to do it better. So there is a new uh, a spec or uh, coming out called Open ID Connect. This is uh, uh, something based top on uh, OAuth tool and doing authentication. So beside of access token, uh, the service provider can send back a uh, ID token, which is a signed uh, JSON web token JWT. And inside the payload, inside the signed payload, uh, you can see there are a lot of attributes. For once, ISS is a issuer, so it's like indicate who is a service provider. The second sub subject is actually the user ID. The, uh, the third one, AUD, is audience, which is a, a, a relevant party. It's usually the relevant party's client ID. And this is a uh, this is like returned uh, within the uh, with uh, same request uh, system returns with access token. So first of all, this everything is signed, so the re uh, relevant party can verify and can guarantee this token is belong to the relevant party. And also, like it save one request, the, uh, the relevant party don't need to make a separate request to know who this user is. And in this payload, we show like in implicit flow, it actually in the very last you can see a AT hash is actually have a hash of access token to make sure this is uh, this is the same access token like sent back to the uh, relevant party. So there is no intercept, there is no forge. So attacker cannot do anything with uh, this uh, ID token. So okay, let's get back to OAuth tool. So where we talk about implicit flow and there is another authorization code or code, code flow. So uh, what is different here is in step two, instead of directly uh, getting back uh, access token to relevant party, authorization code is uh, sent to the relevant party. A relevant party has to use the authorization code and this client credential include the client ID and the client secret to retrieve uh, access token. This has to be done from the RAM party server side because the uh, uh, credential, the secret, need to be stored in the uh, RAM party server. And then RAM party can get the uh, protected resources with the uh, access token. So there are two things need to be uh, mentioned. One is uh, the, uh, the authorization code have to be a uh, one-time password and it need to be, li uh, be short-lived. And also, the service provider need to verify the authorization code belong to the same relevant party. If not, uh, there is a vulnerability over there. So uh, this is a vulnerability we found in a very famous China uh, provider, uh, Sina, and uh, the, uh, the relevant party we use is uh, called Sohu, Sohu News. So uh, uh, first of all, Bob using an application uh, which controlled by attacker, and uh, he uh, the he start with uh, uh, Sina's all to code flow. So Bob's also didn't code can send to uh, uh, the malicious application, and then attacker owns Bob's authorization code. So then attacker using uh, similar to what we had before for the interlist flow, attacker log in uh, Sohu News with attacker's account. Uh, then. Sina gonna send back attacker's authorization code. Attacker intercepts the request, uh, change it to Bob's authorization code, and uh, so who knew gonna send Bob's authorization code to Sina and gets Bob's uh, access token. Now attacker gets full control of uh, Bob's 
Sohu News account. Yeah, this is basically uh, the same turn out from the implicit flow uh, impersonation attack. So how to do this? Uh, right, uh, service provider need to verify all the security critical content, such like uh, authorization code, on the server side, and also uh, relevant party need to store and do secure check uh, always on server side. Okay, we have talked about the attacks which directly associated with the protocol flows. Now let's take a look at the general problems that impact all the different OAuth flows. First, let's get a little bit more about constant page. Constant page is very important because it allows the user to grant permission to the relying party apps. So it is a page that should describe what's the app and who is the user and what kind of information does the app want to access. For example, here are the two, exam here are the two examples of modern constant page from service providers like Facebook and Google. So if there's not enough information in a constant page, you can imagine that users might just grant all permissions, like give all the info secret data inside the service provider to a relying party. But this attack is trivial. Let's say something more interesting which is like when there's lack of constant information that could lead us to hack into the authentication. So here we use the example with Tencent. Tencent is a very big Chinese service provider. You guys might know it from, it's the same provider as WeChat. So it's had over 700 million users over, over China and overseas. So Tencent doesn't provide any information related to the line party. So the app, or the, the user will not know which app they are granting the information to. And also, because app ID is a public information, then attackers can try to trick the user to log into their app, but still seems like a legitimate app. Let's take a look at how this attack could happen. In the first step, on the user device, the user is checked to log in to attacker's mobile app, but the user thinks he's talking to a legitimate app. After user input his Tencent credentials, Tencent will provide an identifier for that user. So the identifier is signed by Tencent and it includes the app ID and the user ID. So in this step, the malicious application will get the special identifier that is associated to the user's account. Because user will not see any difference, because there's no consent. Let's see how attacker can hack into user's account with this identifier. After getting the identifier that's related to user's account, attacker comes into his own mobile device. And the attacker tried to log in with Tencent. Tencent will return the identifier that's linked to attacker's account. But attacker will substitute the identifier. He will use the identifier that's associated to the user's account that he get from the first step. And the relying party will think it's the same benign user. So then the attacker can just log into the benign user's account. He will have whole, full control over the benign user's account. This attack had very serious impact. So around over 700 million users are affected and Tencent acknowledged the vulnerability and patched it within a week. So how can we do it right? As a service provider, uh, you should include username and user profile to let user know that's the user's account who's logged in. And you should also provide client name and icon to let user know which app is asking for the permissions. 
Of course, you should tell the user what permissions will be granted. The second general problem is about state token. So you guys might know the CSF token. So inside OAuth, there's also a similar token that's generated, uh, generated randomly by the relying party to ensure the integrity of the OAuth flow session. If you don't use the state token, like we demonstrate in the GitHub demo, that benign user will be logging to attacker's account, which is a standard logging CSF attack. So they have two steps. First, attacker logging to GitHub account and get authorization code from GitHub. Instead of going on, the attacker send a phishing link to the user that had embed the authorization code. When the benign user Bob render the link, a request will be sent to GitHub server with the authorization code from attacker's account. Then GitHub will, because GitHub, because there's no state token being used, GitHub will just think it's a benign user, uh, sorry, it's an attacker. So the benign user will be logging to the attacker's account. A little bit more detail that first, when attacker starts OAuth flow on his machine, you can see there's no state token being used in this URI. And in the second step, on the user device, when the user tricked into rendering iframe, which contains authorization code from the attacker's account, after that, user will be logged into attacker's account. To do this right, service provider should support state token and relying parties should pass the state token to the provider and also verify the state token. Our final uh, vulnerability is very dangerous because it allows you to break the authentication of Facebook. It's uh, associated with a feature that an both Android and iOS support. That's WebView, which is a browser that bundle, can be bundled inside the mobile app. WebView is very widely used for hybrid apps in development and also for embedding content. For example, for embedding the OAuth login page. WebView is very powerful. It has lots of legitimate user cases. So the app that's embedded WebView can get the cookies from the WebView. There's no enforcement about same origin policy inside WebView. So it's also demonstrated in the demo that we use Facebook as an example to show the attack. First, the developers develop an app and follow exactly the Facebook OAuth flow and develop the, develop the OAuth flow inside WebView instead of using Facebook SDK. Then after user logging with Facebook, the app can get the cookie from Facebook. And the cookie is a long-term cookie, so the apps can do whatever they want with the cookie, like logging to user account. This web view attack has very dangerous consequence that it allows full account compromise. Since web view has lots of legitimate reasons, this usage for allowing people to get cookies inside web view, we don't know any fix for this problem now. We have talked about, we have sampled eight vulnerabilities, but there are actually even more problems. So here comes the one million question. How to do mobile OS security? The answer is, it is very, very hard. But we don't want to discourage people from using mobile OS because it's very widely used and it's so useful. Is there anything we can do? So, if you are a service provider, you should remember this checklist. First, you want to verify the identity of the secret information receivers, like the token of the code. Also, you want to provide informative consent page. Third, you should consider using OpenID Connect for authentication. What if you are a relying party? The most important thing to remember is 
you should never trust the client. Don't store, store any secret in the client, and you should always perform security checks on the server. You should also choose the right flow and follow spec exactly, and you should use the official SDKs to develop your app. Okay, so this is the end of the talk. We hope you guys learned about mobile OS problems and how to avoid them in the best efforts. Thank you. Any questions? Or is that yeah, one thing to mention that all the eight vulnerabilities we talk about, talk about, seven of them are still working. So it's really lots of pitfalls in this area. If you guys, if you guys just use uh, JSON, if you were to just use JSON web tokens instead, uh, they're always signed. So doesn't that prevent a lot of, you know, these issues with OAuth, right? Because if you authenticate with, uh, if you're using JSON web tokens for authentication, can't you just verify that it's always, you know, signed by the Correct uh, service provider, and then you don't run into these types of issues. Uh, that's Open ID Connect, right? So, like in Open ID Connect, the one thing okay. is a uh, uh, ID token, which okay. include uh, is a uh, uh, JWT, which is signed uh, JSON web token, and also as we I already said, like it talk who is the issuer, who is a service provider, and uh, who is a uh, uh, subject, uh, the, the the user, and who is the uh, audience, the uh, uh, relevant party. So everything is signed with a key from the uh, service provider, and you can like in the spec it's like like uh, it also mentioned there's a discover page, so all the relevant party can go to the service provider's discover page and get the key and verify it's like it's uh, the payload is correct. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. <laughs>